Well, thank you for joining us today on the Hara Tour Guide. I am your Hara host, Slaughter Sin, She Wolf, Empress of Gore. We have a fantastic guest with us today. Please introduce yourself and where you're from and what do you do? My name is Harrison Smith. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a director, writer, and producer. I'm known for such films as The Fields, Death House, and Garlic and Gunpowder. Great, thank you. And how long have you been writing and making films, Harrison? Sure, I've been doing it professionally since 2009. Great. And which project gave you your big break in the industry? I'd have to say that would be The Fields with Cloris Leachman and Tara Reid. Now, The Fields was based on a personal experience. Is that correct? That is correct. It's based on an incident that happened in my uh, late summer, early fall of 1973 on my grandparents' farm. Would you like to give us a little insight on that, or do you want to just keep your... <laughs> the, the movie took some license. Uh, I was not the director of the field. It took a little bit of artistic license away, but the overall concept was uh, our farm, my grandparents, I stayed a lot with my grandparents growing up, and they had a small farm at in um, eastern Pennsylvania. And it was surrounded on three sides by miles. For about two weeks, our farmhouse uh, came under attack from one or maybe several people that came out of the corn and just, you know, they, they did things, uh, pulled the power lines, cut the power lines, actually smashed the windows, killed the dogs, that kind of thing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. And so much that it prompted you to make a film about it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so definitely check that one out. <laughs> Uh, what was your inspiration for Death House? It was Gunnar Hansen. Gunnar had always wanted to make a movie that would incorporate a lot of his horror, you know, genre friends. Mm-hmm. And I was approached at a screening in Los Angeles of Zombie Killers by Rick Finkelstein and Stephen Chase of Entertainment Factory to see if I'd be interested in coming on board with Death House. So I did. I met with Michael Eisenstadt, who was Gunnar's agent, and he pitched me the idea that was kind of rounded out as uh, the expendables of horror. And even though I'm not a fan of that description, uh, and the reason why I'm not is, is because it makes people think that we're going to be having a movie filled with Jason and Freddy, uh, mm-hmm. Candyman, and that's all incorrect. I mean, the original Expendables did not have like Stallone and everybody coming back and reprising their action hero roles. So I don't know why people think this is going to be a monster movie mashup mm-hmm. of all the iconic monsters. It is of a lot of the iconic horror figures. But that, you know, Kane Hodder is not playing Jason Voorhees Mm -hmm. or Victor Crawley or or anything like that. In in our case, you know, it it serves its purpose, but it's not really something I would use to describe it. Mm -hmm. I met with Gunnar Hansen, who had an original script. He felt he, and this is by his own account, was not happy with dialogue. He, He did not know how to do dialogue all that well. And he felt that the film was kind of slow. The original premise was uh, some kids in a college class Mm -hmm. went into the bowels of an abandoned asylum. And of course, we find out that it's not so abandoned. He said, you know, look, he goes, I I need some outside input on this. And I said, well, you know, Gunnar, I mean, we've seen this movie a hundred times before, you know, Mm -hmm. like it's the same thing. And I I said to Gunnar and his agent that I really had no interest whatsoever making um, like an R-rated Scooby-Doo episode, you know, where it's just simply, oh, look, there's Sid Haig and then Sid he walks off screen and there's his cameo. Like, mm-hmm. I, I didn't want to do that kind of thing. So I didn't want a gimmick movie. So, you know, we sat down and we talked about different things. And I came up with the idea of making Death House a, a prison, kind of like this super max prison below the ground. And, and that there are a number of them. And what I was inspired by, where I was inspired, was through like the MK Ultra experiments of the 1950s and 60s. Mm-hmm. The whole concept of doing radical, horrific scientific experiments on human beings. Because I think some of the worst horror, like the scariest horror, is social horror. I mean, you know, we we just do awful things to ourselves, like demons and ghosts and monsters. None of that bothers me. But when you start watching, like I consider One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest to be a horror film. I think Nurse Ratched is one of the scariest and most terrible villains that has ever been on screen. I mean, Mm -hmm. she's worse than Michael Myers. She's... She's worse than Freddy Krueger because she's real. There are real nurse ratchets out there. Mm -hmm. For me, I wanted Death House to kind of take on that bent. And also, since most of our stars are from 80s horror films and that that era, I wanted wanted it to have a very distinct 80s flavor, and and it definitely does. Death House owes a lot more to Escape from New York than it does a slasher movie. 
So it has a very Carpenter-esque kind of feel to it nice. and even a, a soundtrack, and that's what I was looking for. Awesome. So you've created some great films like Cam Dread, Death House, Zombie Killers, The Field, Six Degrees from Hell, and now your new comedy, did you say? Yep. I briefly read about that. And how is it going from a horror transitioning to the comedic genre? Refreshing. <laughs> it's <laughs> nice just to do something fun. We laughed. I mean, we laughed a lot on Death House, too. I mean, it, it's not like it's depressing. It's just when you're making a comedy, you're, you're not doing like overnight grinds where everything has to be dark and there's blood everywhere and everybody's mm-hmm. fun. You know, we had some you know funny character actors, had some hot chicks, you know, like you can't really go wrong. And Felissa Rose just absolutely kills it. And she is just fantastic as uh, in the movie. I, I, I love her. She's one of my favorite characters in the movie. Can't wait to see it. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't seen the trailer, check out the trailer. It's, it's very funny. <laughs> Most of your films fall under the horror genre, which I'm very yeah. thankful for. What is it about <laughs> the genre that keeps you going? I grew up enjoying it. And my grandmother was a big fan of, of old school horror, the universal monsters you know and i grew up on a on a saturday afternoon diet of dr shock and you know horror theater chiller theater whatever they call them you, you watch creature feature i mean pretty much every every town across the nation had some local cable channel or station that was broadcasting this kind of stuff <laughs> and uh you know I, I got to watch godzilla and and i enjoyed it. it was a lot of fun by the time i was eight nine years old i could tell you who karloff and Lori and price and cushing all were mm-hmm. you know it brings back a lot of good memories. And, and for me, the, the horror that I enjoy is, is that kind of horror. I, I'm not into the kind of horror which has basically been dubbed like, you know, torture porn. I'm, I'm not into, mm-hmm. you know, hostile or the human centipede where I'm just watching people basically degraded and destroyed for 90 minutes. Like, that's, that's not for me. Like I said, mm-hmm. give me monsters. Give me, give me something like that. that. That's what I'm looking for. Give me mm-hmm. ghosts, monsters, demons. I'll... I'll watch that till the cows come home. But we, we do enough cruelty to each other in real life that why do I want to spend 90 minutes of my life? Like, like I watched Seven on the way out when I was walking out of the theater. They said, you know, what'd you think of it? And I said, well, it's, it's actually too good for its own good. Like, I never want to see Seven again because it just made me feel awful by the time the movie was over. And if you've seen the film, I think you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. It's extremely nihilistic and it offers just zero hope for the human race and makes me feel that, God, I wish there would be a virus that just could take out human beings because we're just despicable creatures, mm-hmm. you know? So, so why do I want to pay to feel that way? Exactly. <laughs> the real horror is but reality. It, right. The real horror is reality. I mean, we, we see on a daily basis now, thanks to the internet of horrors done to our children and, and to each other and in senior care homes and, Animal. On the battlefield and, you know, and, and the, in the name of God, politics, whatever. Why do I want to pay to watch this? Mm-hmm. You know, so exactly. it's, and, and, but that's just my personal opinion. I'm not saying that and none of these films are any good. Mm-hmm. I've watched them, you mm-hmm. know, it's just, I just wouldn't go back and watch them again. Like even one floor of the cuckoo, set, I think is a brilliant motion picture and, and the performances are just so damn good. I just don't ever want to watch it again, you mm-hmm. know, because I feel awful. Mm-hmm. you know, or spend my time watching it. I'd rather watch something else. So what are some of the challenges you face as a writer, director, producer? I think, you know, the shifting climate right now, you know, people always ask me, well, what's coming up for horror? I, I don't know. If I knew that, I'd be making stuff that's, you know, going to go through the roof. But I, I look at things and I, I think the, the biggest challenge is, is writing something that's not just for yourself, but that you hope is going to do well with a general audience. So it, where horror fits in or not even, I, I would love to do more than horror. It's just, you know, fighting for that screen space and what, what are people looking for? And, you know, if it doesn't fit the proper mold, well, you know, like, for example, if you're going to write a supernatural horror, well, it's got to automatically be like The Conjuring. And, and people will say that. Give me The Conjuring, but different. Well, really, you're asking an oxymoron, mm-hmm. you know, give you The Conjuring, but different. Well, what is there to be different? You know, I, so everything now has to be a James Wan supernatural horror type thing with the same formula with an old woman. Let's, let's trot out Lynn Shay and make her a quasi version of Lorraine Warren somewhere along the line. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that's, I think the biggest challenge of trying to write something that that's individual or seen as fresh. But you know, when people say, well, we want something new, well then you give them something new and then they don't like it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they, they want, well, I, I'd rather have the conjuring. I'd rather have paranormal activity. Okay. Well, let's get one more digitally uh, enhanced movie where somebody's walking backwards or bent over or crawling on a wall. Let's do all that because that, or let's do the, Hey, we haven't had enough of this where we close the bathroom mirror and there's some figure in the mirror. You, you know what I mean? Like as much as people rail against it, well, that's what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Data be original, huh? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's hard. You know, I mean, it is. I mean, just look what the summer lineup is. You know, if it isn't Jurassic World, well, then it's going to be the Avengers, and that's pretty much it, <laughs> right? Like, I know. there you go. The remakes and the prequels and the sequels and right, <laughs> and then we're going to remake everything and. You know, and then we're going to have more sequels and we're going to have prequels and, mm-hmm. you know, and then, then when, I mean, wait now, when will they start remaking some of the superhero movies? I'm, I'm ready for that, right? I mean, we already did Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Several right? times. <laughs> yeah. Spider-Man's been remade now. Let's get moving. We got to remake Thor. Got to get moving <laughs> on Iron Man. You know, mm-hmm. let's, let's get moving on remaking those. And for me, the, the biggest challenge is you become part of an issue where, why am I vested into any of these characters? They're only going to remake them anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, why do I care about Spider-Man? Why do I care about Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man when I know that they're just going to go back and expunge that storyline and give us something else? So why do I care? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no vestment into, I mean, would we have really cared about Star Wars knowing 10 years later that would have remade it? There's, there's no like, Oh my God, like Indiana Jones. Like I still, I can tell you sitting in that theater watching, Harrison Ford dragged behind that truck, okay, in the first Raiders of the Lost mm-hmm. Ark movie, and you're at the edge of your seat and all of that stuff. Would I have cared knowing that, uh, they're just going to remake this, so who cares if Indy wins or not, right? right? I mean, I'm watching this, okay, and then five, six years, they're just going to reboot it anyway, mm-hmm. you know? So it takes away some of the vestment factor, I think, for an audience. And, and I really do believe, to finally answer the last part of your question, is – I don't think movies are special anymore. I, I think there's so much content that, that we've forgotten how to enjoy them. And, and we don't watch them properly either. Jaws is not meant to be watched on a tablet. It's not meant to be watched on a phone. And I don't even know if it qualifies to be watched on a 70, you know, LED screen with surround sound and a, in a home theater. Jaws is meant for the big screen. Mm-hmm. So is Apocalypse Now. So is... You know, so are many films. I mean, Lawrence of Arabia meant for a giant screen. There's a reason why they shot them in seven millimeter, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if we're not doing that and we're just, you know, squeezing this stuff down and, you know, okay, here's Star Wars kids and get your tablet out. It doesn't have the same impact. Mm-mm. I feel that the, the problem even goes further and that, you know, back in the day when cassette was coming, whether it was beta or VHS, I think the studios should have had some kind of summit meeting and I think they should have sat down and said, okay, let's all talk about our catalogs and we're going to release certain parts of our catalogs to home video. But I really think all of us as studios here should find some kind of an accord or a pact that we're never going to release certain of our titles on home video and keep them as a cultural kind of binder. If that makes sense, movies will bind people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, you know, certain films like The Godfather or Star Wars or whatever should be released every 10 years, you know what I mean, theatrically, mm-hmm. and roll them out with, with fanfare like you did before and catch a whole new generation instead of, you know, I mean, look at the, the original copies of a lot of these films. They were thrown out in pan and scan and grainy transfers and, you know, there was nothing special about it. They were all looking to cash in on a quick buck. Mm-hmm. So if we treat our product like that, well, then we're going to treat it all like that. And then, you know, movies are no longer events or special. They become McDonald's, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with McDonald's. There's nothing wrong with a fast food burger. I'd like a Big Mac once in a while. But when that becomes your steady diet, well, then you, you kind of get what you put into you, you know? And so people lament, you know, the state of motion picture, you know, the motion picture industry these days. But we're kind of we're kind of responsible for all of that. Agreed. You know, I mean, I, look, I've seen Jaws. Uh, I, I remember when I turned forty, someone uh, took me to see it again on the big screen. They had a revival of it in a big theatrical, and it was just as I mean, I've seen the movie. I'm I'm not kidding. I've, I've probably seen the movie 150 times, mm-hmm. and 
yet there it is on the big screen again. I mean, I saw it as a boy on the big screen. When it first came out, I saw it as a boy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, the magic was all back. And people still stood and applauded at the end. Now, they, many of them, I'll bet, sitting in a theater like me, had a Blu-ray copy of it already, right? Mm -hmm. It sits in their home. They can watch it anytime, but yet they paid money to come back into that giant screen to watch it as a theatrical experience. Yeah. I've seen a number of, of younger kids, you know, that sit and watch movies and they just skip to the parts. They don't mm -hmm. even watch the movie. They don't know how to watch a movie properly. The, you know, movie is about character development and story evolution and getting into it and, and feeling things. Instead, it's like, nope, I just want to get to the good part. Let's get to where the T-Rex breaks out. Let's get to where this happens. And that's it. Mm -hmm. They're not watching movies properly. That would be like taking a book and just highlighting all the good parts and then saying you read the book. So that's my answer. <laughs> it's a great answer. And I agree you. with you 100%. <laughs> Can you tell me about some of your most memorable moments on and off camera? Sure. I mean, you know, working on each film is, is individual, you know, like you, you don't know what it could be like. You have different crews, although most of my crew stays the same, but you have different actors and, and they all bring a different temperature and flavor, you know, to the film. So my experience with the fields making my first movie is very different than making garlic and gunpowder because the fields for me was an absolute miserable experience. So miserable that I've said, and I say it without exaggeration, I would go through the death of my mother again, didn't do the fields again in the way wow. that we did it. The fields was so miserable. Uh, there, there were times that, I mean, it made me question whether to stay in this industry or not. Imagine that you, all your life, you, you've wanted to do something and suddenly you get the opportunity to do it and you hate it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it really was. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't just one thing. It wasn't any person. It was the entire experience. So, but then, you know, you have a wonderful experience on Six Degrees of Hell, and then it's like, okay, I think I can do this. You know, like Camp Dread was my directorial debut, and it was a lot of fun. It was, it was truly like being at summer camp. Death House was a lot of fun to make with all those horror icons. And, and the thing is, it's not a single diva. Like, those people were some of the nicest people I ever got to work with. A garlic and gunpowder, I'm not kidding. We laughed every day. I mean, I, I would laugh so hard at what they were doing on camera that you know, I ruined the take. You know, like, I, I laughed. I mean, and they caught me on the mic going, eh, we caught you. You can't, can't be laughing. It's like, I know, but it's hard. It's funny. <laughs> and when is a garlic and gunpowder? It, it's mean? out right now. You can find oh. it um, on Amazon. You can find it on iTunes, Vudu, Roku. It's heading to Walmart on DVD in, on June 12th. Yeah, it's out everywhere. It's oh, on great. Google Play. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be seeing it on Netflix coming up. It'll be on demand, all that stuff. So, um, but it's doing well. The reviews are good. One person wrote, this is so stupid, 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 stupid that I watched it again. <laughs> and I thought, there you go. That's all I need to know. Because it, 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 it is. It draws you. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Out of all the scripts and films that you've completed, is there any one that resonates with you the most? Wow. Well, I would say The Fields because it was my most personal. You know, it was about me and my grandparents. It was really a valentine to my grandparents. It's really what it was. The little boy in the film is very quiet and very withdrawn, which is not how I was in real life. So, you know, there are a lot of things that were very different about the fields. But I would say, you know, Cloris Leachman and Bev Appleton, who played my grandparents, mm -hmm. they nailed it. I mean, that's the closest I'm ever going to get to seeing my grandparents talk and interact with each other again. You know, and there, there it is. Like when I watch those scenes of them at the kitchen table and stuff like that, I'm like, oh, my God. It's like I'm right back there. You know, it's that that part is fantastic. So I would say the, the fields probably is the one that resonates uh, the most with me. Although with Camp Dread, it was a lot of fun to write just because I wanted to write something in the vein of Psycho 2. Tom Holland wrote the script for Psycho 2. And I, I just loved Psycho 2. I think it was a big impact on me growing up. And it was Holland's script because, I, I mean, I walked into Psycho 2 as a boy fully expecting to hate this movie. You know, like how dare anybody make a sequel to Psycho and it's going to suck and it's going to be like Friday the 13th. I called my parents at the payphone. I said, listen, I'm not coming home. I'm going to go back in and catch this movie again. <laughs> so I loved it. So 
and it was nice to be surprised, right? Like you go in yeah. with, and there was no internet at that time to ruin everything for you. You know, now you, like you saw these clowns a couple weeks ago saying, Oh, Jason Blum screened a, a, a cut of the new Halloween and it's terrible. And people are, and he's all upset. First of all, that's not true at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not, not true at all. Mm-hmm. You, you have people ruining everything exactly. now, you know, like, and they, and just in the rush to ruin it. Like mm-hmm. imagine if we had the empire strikes back today, you wouldn't be able to keep the secret if Darth Vader is Luke's father or not, because, you know, I can't get a girlfriend, but I can post this information. <laughs> Damn you haters. <laughs> right. But you know what I'm saying? Like, why do we, like, I, I don't think we should be showing on DVD and all that stuff, all the behind the scenes stuff. It gives away the magic, mm-hmm. you know? I, I mean, I, 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 look, when I sat in Jurassic Park for the very first time, I sat in the theater, and when that T-Rex broke out, I turned to the person sitting next to me, and I didn't say how they do it. I said, geez, where'd they get one? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? And and that was magic, you know? Mm-hmm. The yin and yang of the industry, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I saw somewhere that you were working on a sequel to Death House. Is that true? That is correct. There are five total films planned, but Death House 2 is ready to go. So there's five total films associated with the Death House? Correct. Okay, well, that's exciting. Yes. Um, can you share something about the Death House or I, sequel or no? It's subtitled, it's subtitled The Farm. Okay. And it's pretty brutal. Oh, we love brutal films. It, <laughs> sure, it is pretty brutal. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think it's better than the original. Is there any other films that we should be expecting from you? Is there anything that you'd like to share about any of your upcoming projects? I, I do, but I don't. Um, I never, because, you know, then I go and I list the project and then the financing falls out and you get people going, oh, I thought you said you were doing this. You know, like it's always that stuff. I've got a number of films in development right now. One that we're just waiting on pretty big names to lock in if they, if they will accept our offer. And I will be shooting one called The Mill, which is set to go with some pretty big names that, are, they're, that they've got the script out to. But it looks like a late September, early October shoot date in Puerto Rico on that. And it's a supernatural horror. And I'm really excited about it. It'll be my biggest budgeted film yet. Oh, my goodness. Just you saying that makes me excited. I'm I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> oh. Um, does it have anything to do in the area of the observatory? Because uh, supposedly uh, there's the biggest satellite for alien encounters over there. No, it, it won't have anything to do with any of that, no. Okay. But we are familiar with that because the location scouts have brought back you know, packets of information. And that did appear. I remember seeing something in a PDF about that. Well, you have some great locations to work with out, out there. Yes, I've been there before. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Yes, and it's also a place, I mean, it's, there are stories upon stories of, you know, traditional, like, haunted stories about everything from witches to chupacabra. So you're, like, in the perfect place, actually, to film that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I got very excited with that. <laughs> Which horror character or type would you identify with most and why? I would say that I'd have to identify with uh, Jack Torrance from The Shining. Oh, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm I think that'd be the closest, time. yeah. <laughs> I know this is kind of always a hard question because there's never really just one, but if you had to pick one, what is your favorite horror film? Oh, wow. You mean just like my favorite or one that made an impact on me, like scary? Like, you know what I mean? Like... Mm-hmm. Hard to say that. I, I know it's, it's it's a difficult question, but I would say okay if you had to choose one of each. One I would that, say the one that I enjoy, the one that I enjoy the most would be Tom Holland's Night, nineteen eighty five. Yes. Um, that film, an impact on me, the nineteen seventy eight invasion of the body snatchers, and the reason why I think we've become a reflection of of what transpires in that movie. Great answer. Is there any advice that you can give to fellow filmmakers that's trying to make it into this industry? Absolutely. Don't talk about it. <laughs> Don't sit around and talk and write critiques and endless blogs and all that stuff. Get out and do it. You heard it from the man himself, guys. Go out there and do it. <laughs> <laughs> and if someone wants to read more about you or your films, where can they go to find you? Well, I mean, they, they can find me on Twitter at Harrison Smith 85 
they're welcome to to go to my blog, which I write for pleasure every once in a while called Cinema, C-Y-N-E-N-A. It's about the effect of cynicism on filmmaking. Oh, interesting. You definitely yeah. have to check that out. Thank you for that. Yep, it's at horrorfuel.com. Okay, and we can find that on Twitter as well? Do they have a yeah, I think I have a link to it on, on my account. But I tweet about it all the time, you know, and I, I post up different articles. And, and again, it's not film review. It's it's about how the the effects of cynicism have, have permeated the industry and, and the entertainment that we watch, where I really do feel that we're, we're just not enjoying movies as much as we used to. Now everything is under the scrutiny of cynicism, you know, like, oh, well, I know how to do this. And, oh, well, you know, this one is, this, this celebrity scandal has tainted this. And it's sometimes just watch a movie, dude. I agree. There's a lot lost nowadays. And, and also agree. there's like a hypersensitivity out there, like a level of, of hyper, course. you know, the scare Absolutely. factor is losing it. Well, thank you for your time, Harrison Smith. Oh, one last question. The B in your name. What does yes. the B stand for? Bruce. Bruce. Okay, great. Did you prefer to be called Harrison? Because I was just... Yeah, I, I prefer Harrison. <laughs> okay. I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Bruce. And uh, Harrison was my grandfather's name. Oh, okay, great. Well, thank you for your time, Harrison, with the Horror Tour Guide. And we look forward to watching more of your creative masterpieces. <laughs> and uh, thank you once again. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs>